Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and we have some news today. Creative Assembly have just dropped a new blog titled Addressing the Chaos Debate. And what this blog is, is it goes over a lot of questions that have been rising around the monogods, the wars of chaos, why characters are going to the wars of chaos, certain things like that, and even a few things like hints regarding the future. So, yeah, let's talk about it. I think this is going to be quite a good thing. It's actually quite nice that Creative Assembly have done this because it answers quite a lot of questions. It raises a few more, though. So, without further ado, let's begin. So, we've got quite a meaty section here titled The Chaos Q&A. And the first question is, why are the four new Legendary Lords considered Warriors of Chaos? Let's read over it and let's discuss, yeah? With this being the first Warriors of Chaos pack since 2015, oh my god, we wanted to reintroduce this iconic race in a way that was benefiting of their infamous world-ending reputation. Let's not relive the end times, please. To that end, introducing four legendary lords, each of whom is aligned with one of the four Chaos Gods, was a flavorful way to start, particularly given that we've already introduced two undivided lords in the form of Archaon and Kolek. Yeah, so far so good, and I think that makes a lot of sense, considering that we did also get the inclusion of monogod factions in the game itself, so let's carry on. Beyond the flavor that each champion could bring to this Lord's pack, we found that several design elements aligned exceptionally well with the revamped Warriors of Chaos mechanics. For instance, the vision for Azazel was that he's been sent out into the world to find and lure promising undivided champions into devoting themselves to Sunesh. He's basically an evil talent scout, a role implied as far back as Morka the Uniter, who may have been persuaded along his path to become the first ever chosen way back in the days of Sigma. Yeah, this is something from one of the older lore books, and I think that's actually kind of nice that they're just inspired by that type of stuff. That was a random foghorn pickers, yeah, port city. Anyways, yeah, yeah, so far everything's very, very promising. I like the idea of that. I think that that's actually quite good. And, I mean, it's a Zazel. I'm gonna have an obvious bias. Let's move on. For some characters, it would have been very hard to find a niche for them in the Monogods roster. Festus is a good example here. He's a durable lore of Nurgle spellcaster who's a master of brewing plagues. But how do you make him interesting alongside Korgath, who is better at all those things in addition to throwing some exploding Nurglings? The answer? put Festus in the Warriors of Chaos, and you've immediately got a combination of features that's entirely unique. Yeah, okay, fair play. I actually kind of like this, because, yeah, if you look at it, it's the same thing as certain characters, like even, I don't know, even Epidemius. They're way too similar. So, yeah, moving him around and moving into a different faction, but still being of the same alignment... Yeah, okay, let's move on. Finally, this approach allowed us to push the quality of the pack far higher than we could have otherwise. Having the whole team laser focused on a shared feature set meant that every single playtest, improvement, and bug fix benefited all the characters rather than one. Okay, that's, uh, that's talking quite highly there. And yeah, I guess if they focus everything directly on chaos... Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense here. So in theory, when this DLC pack does get shown off by creators, when we get early access or it gets released, this should have a lot less bugs than what we're used to when a normal Lord pack releases. Okay, yeah, fair play. Now let's move on to the last section, because I kind of like this, right? It needs to be stressed, though, that even in this context, our goal was to create four ways of chaos experiences that feel like Korn, Nurgle, Sunesh, and Zinch. Much in the same way that Wolfheart and the new Volkmar feel like Empire factions even though they don't share the same mechanics as Carl Franz. These are true hybrids, drawing a ton of flavor and gameplay from their relevant Dark God. They'll be fully capable of running armies that will look very much like the ones you'd see when playing as the relevant God-specific race, but with Dragon Ogres. Okay, yeah, so we're going to be able to play Monogod style, but in its Warriors variant. I kind of like the idea of that, yeah. So far, this is all looking very, very promising. Well, sounding very promising. And I like the idea. I think that they're trying to do sub-factions, but in its own way, in a sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I, I mean, I'm reading this for the first time as I'm reading it with you guys. 
And so far, I'm liking what's being said. Now, this section is really, really interesting. So the question is, where does this leave the monogod races of Korn, Sinesh, Nurgle, and Zinch? It is important to state that the new DLC characters existing within the Warriors of Chaos does not prevent us from adding mortal characters to the monogod rosters. I'm thinking Tamukon, but let's carry on, right? This is something that we confront on a DLC by DLC basis. In some instances, mortal characters might fit better alongside a demon focused roster or the mono god mechanics. Ooh, cool. In others, the roster might end up with wildly different bespoke features, feature sets, more appropriate to the given faction. Oh, okay. Don't worry, there's plenty of exciting characters who will be joining the mono gods in the future. They've already got a lot of plans. Okay. I, I'm just going to say it's likely going to be Tamakon because it makes sense for Tamakon. Maybe Skull Bladraff. Let's not speculate though because uh, <laughs> I'm excited enough as it is, but we still have to wait for these characters to actually come into the game. We still have four legendary lords that we're waiting to play. But it's nice that they've already got characters in mind. I just can't wait for the Mask of Sinesh or, you know, Skulltaker. I know a lot of people aren't so keen on him, but I'm a massive fan of Skulltaker. I love his lore, so yeah. Right, let's continue. It's also worth stressing that this pack will still massively transform the monogod playstyle. In some cases, their rosters are almost doubling in size, with each god gaining a new hero, two lords to lead their armies, top off by the ability to convert mortal lords into demon princes. Sweet. Sweet. Absolutely sweet. I'm loving the fact that this is going to be a thing. So, this is DLC which is benefiting loads of other factions too, and I, I, I'm all freaking for it. So let's carry on. Even all the lords are getting updated with cultists now riding their new war shrines into battle. Ma yes, 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 yes. Oh yeah, I'm really happy about that. Okay. Yeah, so they got them as mounts. I, I am super happy because I love war shrines. I'm a big fan of them in the tabletop. I've mentioned it in many videos. So this is cool for me. Okay, let's continue. Combined with the talent balance changes and the new Immortal Empire stunning positions, we're pretty sure the Monogods will offer a ton of fresh new experiences. Yeah, freaking sounds like it. Oh, Nikari with Chaos Warriors of Sinesh just rampaging all across of Orf 1. That's going to be really fun. That's going to be really, really fun. I am totally excited. This is going to be cool. Right, so the next section is, why are there two Sinesh legendary lords in the Warriors of Chaos? And I can't answer on behalf of Creative Assembly. It's because Sinesh is the best Chaos God, and anyone who else thinks otherwise clearly has some sort of problem. Nah, I'm kidding. All right, let's actually check out why this is the reason. So, with hindsight, everything is much clearer. It's fair to say that if Sigvald hadn't already been in the game since 2016... He would have undoubtedly be the Sinesh champion of Zazel's place. Yeah, it makes sense because Sigvald was an 8th edition lord. Beyond that, we wanted to ensure that all four Dark Gods had representation within this pack in order to provide you with a larger variety of legendary lords to play at launch. Again, fair. Plus, we really like the whole Swiss army. Yeah, we hear that a lot. They've said that like nine times already. Okay. Ultimately, our aim has been to ensure that both Suneshi lords offer a distinct playstyle. As Azazel is a demon prince, he has a narrower choice of units to recruit from, solely focusing on undivided and Suneshi units. While Sigvald has the potential to branch out into units from all four pantheons on undivided. Eek. Okay. That's not to say you'll see Sigvald leading armies of Screaming Hornet Berserkers or Festering Nurgle Worshippers due to the Dark Authority system see below. Okay, there's something that they're going to show off now. Sigvald's own personal retrieve will maintain a distinctively Sinesh flavor and he'll need to do some delegation in order to efficiently maintain units devoted to other gods. So even though there's only one lord in the Sinesh race, you've got three very dis different ways to, to play Sinesh theme campaign. Okay, right, so you can play Sigvald Undivided, or at least the faction, which I guess it makes sense because he comes with Kolek and Archeon. I would have liked if, like, if you have the DLC, then it automatically just gives you access to the Sineshi one and you would be a Sinesh Lord. But I guess this also makes sense because, like they said, it's different play styles. I'll have to wait and see how that works. I guess, well, yeah. There's not really much point complaining. If I don't want to use the other units, I simply don't have to. Yeah, problem solved. This next section is actually quite large. How do the unit rosters work in campaign? While the Warriors of Chaos can eventually access a truly vast array of mortal and demonic units, it's not just a case of constructing specific buildings and spewing out multicolored units. Much like the lore, you'll have to work 
hard to amass the forces of multiple gods, and certain characters will find it easier or more difficult than others. Okay, this is sounding pretty interesting, let's kind of move on to the next section then. Every unit in the roster is treated as either a warband unit or a gifted unit. Warband units are your bread and butter, consisting of mortal humans as well as the bulk of the undivided monstrous units. Almost all of them can be marked, an act that devotes them to a specific god and turns them into a new unit with new visuals, stats and even new voice lines, though you can't necessarily mark a unit right from the start. Okay, not too bad, we already know that they need ranks and so on and sometimes you need to get uh, technology. So yeah, that sounds pretty fun, new stats too is good, so they'll theme more to the god. Now, gifted units are primarily demons accompanied by a few specialist non-demonic units, such as Hell Cannons and Shagoths, and are recruited by spending souls on Chaos Gifts, hence the name, okay, or via certain special events, even better, so events also give you units too, I'm happy about that. The catch? There's a cap on the number of these gifted units that you can have in any given army, that is, unless you're Bellacor, who can recruit as many as he likes. Like marks, these options aren't necessarily available from the very start of your campaign. Okay, yeah, so far so good. You can't doomstack a few demons, which eh, I guess kind of makes sense. But yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of happy. All this sounds really fun. And we got some specifics with the legendary lords, so let's talk about them. Bellacor can recruit a whole bunch of gifted units from turn one onward, but must unlock the ability to mark mortals in his skill tree. So more of a demon focus at the very beginning, which kind of makes sense because it is Bellacor. But you've got access to both rosters, so yeah, I mean, that sounds good. Sigvald can recruit Sinesh mortals and demons from turn 1 onward, but must wait to unlock the other gods' forces. Yeah, okay, makes sense, it's thematic. Archeon can unlock the ability to recruit god-specific units and is best suited to access and lead forces that mix and match with a bit of everything. So, just kind of tailoring to a proper undivided force, and that by that means like even marked units sounds like it would work best. Okay, not too bad. Everything sounds awesome. And then Kolek will have the hardest time getting access to god-specific units, kind of makes sense, but has easier access to Dragon Ogres and Dragon Ogre Shagoths. Again, makes a lot of sense. I like the theming. I really like the theming. I think that this is going to be a campaign which you're going to be able to just replay Warriors of Chaos by playing all the Legendary Lords and still have something new to do, which, yeah, I'm keen. Now, the next section. On top of these special conditions, a Dark Authority system restricts which units you can include in any given army. God-specific units simply won't follow anyone. For example, if you want Nurgle followers or demons in your army, you'll need a Nurgle Lord or hero in the army to keep them in line. Otherwise, they'll suffer from increased upkeep and ooh, reduced replenishment. Interesting. And if you try and put corn units in an army with Sinesh characters, or god forbid, a wizard, you'll need to make sure that a proper Cornite character is there present to balance things out. We really want to sell the idea that these warbands are perilous coalitions of rivals, forcing you, the player, to think carefully about how you... how you play your armies, I'm imagining, um, but it's fine. Um, yeah, I like this, I like this, I really, really like this. It makes sense, it's... It's got a lot of lore into it. I, I feel like they're really going full hand for this DLC. Obviously, we have to wait until we see proper gameplay, but um, I like this. I like this. I imagine that Dark Authority also has some other things. Maybe some bonuses to us, or it can't just all be negatives, that's for sure. But yeah, yeah, this all sounds... Um, this sounds good. This sounds really, really good. I'm actually surprised. Alright, so another section. What's special about the new DLC Lords? Comparatively, the four new DLC lords are almost akin to a sub-race. I love the fact that they said sub-race because you know how much I've been asking for these types of things within the Warriors. Lords who are more closely aligned to their specific god and thus limited in their access to the full suite of marked units in lieu of their patron. God-specific units alongside the undivided. 
to accommodate this sacrifice, they instead gain a variety of specialist advantages. They can begin marking mortals and recruiting demons from turn one, and will find it both easier and cheaper to do so. Cool. That sounds awesome. They share a uniquely structured tech tree, about half of which is built for their particular faction, that allows for more specialization in god-specific units and mechanics. Yeah, so this is really, really cool. I like the idea of that. They spread and benefit more from their god's corruption, but are actively penalized by the corruption of an opposing god. Again, very thematic, makes a lot of sense. They get versions of certain campaign features belonging to the main demon faction. For example, Festus can brew and spread potions, but they have slightly different effects to Kogaths. Okay, again, I like the sound of this. This is a sub race, and we are all hoping for more and more sub races for Warhammer 3. Well, the Warhammer series in general. This is the first time we're going to get this, and it sounds really freaking good. So yeah, I'm happy. So let's continue. There's also a ton of other variations we've made where appropriate. For example, vassals belonging to the DLC lords will take on certain tributes from their masters, spreading their favored corruption and gaming thematic bonuses in battle. Again, really, really cool. Like the idea. They've even got unique ways to keep their troops in line. Festus, as an example, can get more Nurgle authority by bestowing his armies with plagues. Oh, okay making it easier for him to put Nurgle troops into undivided lead forces. Okay, okay, yeah, this all sounds really interesting. So far, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm very happy. All in all, we've tried to make these four champions feel different from the rest of the Warriors of Chaos. Our dialogue engineers have even gone so far as to ensure that these units in these characters' armies use different voice lines when led by one of the characters. Oh, wow. You'll hear Marauders and Warriors and Chosen in Azazel army shouting their allegiance not just to Sinesh, but to Azazel himself. Perfect. So thematic. I love this. This is so, so good. I hope that they're going to do something similar when we get other lords too. I mean, it makes sense for the Chaos factions, you know, like Tamilcon and all that. On top of all that... They also participate in a new, in a brand new campaign set in the Realms of Chaos map, which offers a dramatic narrative following the main game's Ursan storyline. It's a nifty alternate take on the Rift system, one with more control in the lead up to a truly epic finale. Well, we already know the storyline's gonna have to center around Zanbaijin. I am so curious. I know some of you guys aren't interested in this map. And that's fair, Immortal Empires is coming at the same time. But from a person who's read that Tamukan book front to back constantly, Zambaijin is so important in the lore, I really hope we get to see it. I really, really hope we get to see it. And lastly, we have some information regarding Confederation. Initially, the team were aiming for Archeon at minimum to be able to confederate all the warriors of Chaos. However, there were some significant technical and balance issues that we were unable to resolve in the time we had to implement the rest of their feature overhauls, okay? Given the technical issues, we were concerned that launching with Confederation enabled could jeopardize the core experience of the Warriors of Chaos. As such, we chose to disable the option for the initial release of Immortal Empires. With that said, we know that this is important to you and we'll be looking to enable some form of Confederation for the Warriors in a post-release patch. Okay, fair enough. We'll talk more about how we'll aim to accomplish that feat in the future. Yeah, fair play, they're already looking into it. And yeah, if they've got different types of skill trees and, you know, tech trees because of the Chaos Lords and all that, they all have different ones, it seems. I understand why that might be a bit weird. So yeah, fair play, fair play. At least they're looking into it. And I think the people will be happier for it now that it's been you know, just like outright said that they're going to look at it. And nothing really at the end. They're just saying that they're going to show off a new champion soon. And yeah, that's it. I, I'm kind of happy. I think these blogs are really good. I, I hope that they keep these blogs coming. Obviously, it's going to slow down after the DLC. And it kind of makes sense. But it wouldn't be nice to get an update like once a month or something along these lines. Because I think that these are such good ways of communication. I'm really happy so far. The DLC sounds big hype. I can't wait to play. I hope it's soon. I really hope it's soon. And uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. We'll start a bit of discussion and all that. Uh, just a quick heads up. I do apologize if I was a bit jumpy with the recordings and so on. I've not slept in like two days. I've got some stuff going on in the background. Some personal matters. And it's required a lot of time. <laughs> but uh, things should start lining up soon, I hope. Because I'm really tired and I need some sleep. 